I mean, what happened to the franchise? What happened? What happened? It sounds crazy to say this out loud, but the original X-Men movie is 20 years old. Yeah, the movie that revitalized the superhero genre has been around for two decades. Before the MCU, before the Dark Knight trilogy, before the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, there was X-Men. What you need to understand is that at this point in movie history, superhero and comic book movies were considered box office poison. If it had a cable cow, it was expected that it would suck. Christopher Reeve's Superman had suffered from one too many bad sequels. The Batman movies had become over-stylized toy commercials with thin plots, awful dialogue, and cheesy one-liners. And Marvel? Well, uh, the less said about them, the better. So how did this movie save an entire genre? Well, before we go into that, let's take a look at the development and history of this movie. Development began as far back as 1984, with talks of James Cameron producing and Catherine Bigelow directing. A revolving door of writers and directors came and went, but in 1996, Brian Singer got the job, with David Hayter penning the script. Although David Hayter is credited as the sole screenwriter, he took a lot of notes and story beats from Christopher McQuarrie's script. Christopher McQuarrie had previously worked with Brian Singer in 1995's The Usual Suspects. When it came to casting, Russell Crowe was the first choice to play Wolverine, but he turned it down and recommended that they give it to his friend, an unknown Australian actor named Hugh Jackman. All the considerations for the part included, but were not limited to, Keanu Reeves, Mel Gibson, Aaron Eckhart, John claude Van Damme, and Edward Norton. I know it's hard to imagine anyone else but Hugh Jackman playing the part, but it's crazy to think how many notable actors were considered. Ian McKellen was initially hesitant to take the role, as he wanted to star in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. However, Brian Singer arranged it so that he could finish all his scenes by the end of 1999 so he could fly down to New Zealand to star as Gandalf the Grey. Coincidentally, another actor who would be considered for the role of Magneto was Sir Christopher Lee, who would go on to star opposite Ian McKellen in the exact same trilogy as Saruman the White. The movie opened on July 14th, 2000 and grossed $296.3 million worldwide making it the ninth highest grossing movie of that year. Now, that may not sound like a lot, especially in a time where the top three or five movies make a billion dollars each, but considering its modest $75 million budget, that was enough for it to be considered a success. Plus, the highest grossing movie at the time was Mission Impossible 2 with just over $536 million. A sequel was made, and the rest is history. The movie works not only as an adventure story, but also a showcase of character journeys and the dynamics within the team. While Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart steer the show as Wolverine and Charles Xavier, the script gives plenty of attention to Halle Berry, Frank Jensen, and James Marsden as Storm, Jean Grey, and Cyclops, respectively. Each actor has enough material to work with, which gives each character a distinct personality and their own time in the spotlight. I'd argue that this is a better team-up movie than the first Avengers. While both films feature superpower beings coming together to take down a powerful villain, X-Men manages to weave in Rogue and Wolverine's time at the mansion without slowing down the overall story. The Avengers moseys along until Loki escapes, then moves up to the climatic battle, they have that battle, and then it ends. X-Men cuts back and forth between Magneto and his cohorts and the X-Mansion, maintaining the threat of the villain and moving the plot along. 
In the comics, there's always been an underlying theme of discrimination and prejudice, with Professor X and Magneto often being compared to MLK and Malcolm X. They both have the same goal, although one preaches peace and unity, and the other suggests using more aggressive and revolutionary tactics. Charles Xavier believes that mentoring mutant youth, helping them control their powers and integrate into society will calm humanity's fear of mutants. Eric Lynchard, on the other hand, believes that using terror and violence is the only way to be accepted. In the movie, the menace of the Mutant Registration Act is what motivates these two men. The act will require mutants to be registered, but Lynchard, being a Holocaust survivor, is a more aggressive opposer of the bill. His plan is to use a machine that triggers a mutation in humans against the world leaders during a summit. He intends to capture Rogue and use her for the machine, and essentially make her a martyr for the cause. He initially tests it against Senator Robert Kelly, the key supporter of the act, who ends up dying after his mutation spirals out of control. Even though the CGI is dated, the death itself is pretty disturbing. One thing I'm surprised I haven't seen or heard anyone talk about is how Magneto's plan strikes a disturbing similarity to the Nazis' idea of a master race. Either your mutation kills you or you're able to control it, and you are now considered a superior being. Eric Lyncher had become the very thing he claimed to be fighting against. You don't get that kind of nuance on commentary in movies these days, much less superhero flicks. It reminded me a bit of Killmonger, and I know Black Panther tends to divide people politically, but Killmonger's idea of a better world is creating a Wakandan empire, even though he claims to be fighting against imperialism. In attempts to fight a monster, these men became monsters themselves. They gazed into the abyss, and the abyss gazed back. As great as this movie is, it's not without its weaknesses. Half, if not most, of Patrick Stewart's lines are exposition dumps, making Professor X feel like the side character in a video game whose sole purpose is to provide information about the world around you. Despite the movie's attempts to downplay her importance, Rogue feels like a walking MacGuffin who never really develops as a character, and just hangs around in the background until the movie needs her to do something. The fight between Mystique and Wolverine has so many cuts and weird angles, it's obvious they are trying to hide their shortcomings. They try their best to make it look cool, but it just comes across as goofy. There are a few moments here and there where the CGI doesn't look as sharp, but it was at the turn of the millennium and CGI was still a developing technology. The movie ends with a blatant tease of a sequel, which is fairly standard for a superhero film, and it obviously did get that sequel, but at the time, it felt like they were setting up a follow-up to something they didn't know whether or not it would work. When looking back on this movie, it's kind of funny how many tropes of the genre it started. A villain whose plan involves some kind of machine or weapon. A CGI-heavy climatic battle. The device being placed on a tall structure in New York City. The hero saving the day at the last possible moment. It's evident that X-Men has been a huge influence on the genre. All in all, X-Men is a fun romp of a superior movie. With great character moments, action spectacle, a brisk yet enjoyable pace, solid writing, and a thrilling final showdown. The fight between Sabretooth and Wolverine deserves to be recognized as one of the greatest superhero battles of all time. This movie proves that if you give the source material enough credit and respect, superhero movies can be fun, thought-provoking, and all-around entertaining. The impression it made can be found throughout the entire franchise as well as other movies in the genre, and not just because of the tropes I mentioned earlier. At the time, it was amazing that they were able to turn something that was thought to be unfilmable into something that was great. I think it deserves its spot in superhero movie history, and I think if you're looking to get into the genre more, or if you've been a longtime fan, you should definitely check it out. However, part of that movie's greatness is overshadowed by other entries in the franchise and the genre. I don't think it will have you coming back again and again, but it's entertaining, and definitely deserves the respect for laying the groundwork that is superhero movies today. I'm thinking of giving it a nice 7.5 out of 10. It's a shame the franchise ended the way it did with Dark Phoenix, but hopefully, New Mutants will rectify some of that when it eventually comes out.